so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to talk about very essential things about civic tech. We are going to talk about whether we are transforming society through technology, what are the limits and the boundaries, and for that we have a great panel. I invite my colleagues to come to the stage. Please, Tiago Peixoto from the World Bank, Ed McClough from Gather, Gunnar Grimson from Citizen Foundation, and Amelie Bansett from Etalab. Before we start, uh, I would like to invite you to participate in this session because we want to, to hear from you. Uh, we invite you to go into the Slido website to post some questions if you feel like that. Otherwise, at the end of the session, we will let some time to, to question for the audience. So we, you can just drop and ask, raise your hand and we will lend you the microphone. So. We want really to hear from all of you. We just have a session before this, uh, something called Fishball, uh, which is a very interesting session of talking and having a very rich conversation with people about civic tech. And there we hear some essential questions like whether civic technology is changing our democracies and making us stronger, whether people are really getting back the control and the power to, to set the agenda, uh, what are the risks at the danger, and the dangers, and who's controlling this civic technology. Those are the things that, that I would like to talk about with our panelists. Uh, First, I would like to invite them to present themselves and their work. Uh, shall we start with Amélie, please? So, my name is Amélie Banzé. I work for Etalab, uh, which is uh, within the Prime Minister, the French Prime Minister office, the task force in charge of open data and open government. So, the, the basic, the core mandate of Etalab is opening the data, and we, we have a, we developed a platform called data.gouv.fr that enables to public to publish public data, but as well as all kinds of data and all the reuse, the uses that are made out of these data. But beyond the data, uh, beyond this uh, work on transparency and, and, and giving back the data to the citizens for social and economic growth, we started working on opening governments. What does it mean, opening government? It's basically making sure that the citizen can um, understand how the decisions are made and can also and, and testing all kinds of different practices, and we're really testing right now um, the way that uh, the state and the citizens can be closer and, and can talk better and make the dialogue easier, more fluid, and, and transforming the way the administration is working to make it work with it with really the expertise and, and, and the the outside intelligence of all the citizens. Good. Yes, uh, hi, thanks for uh, having me here and thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Gunnar Grimson, uh, G. Grims on uh, Twitter. Uh, I've been working with the Citizens Foundation in Iceland since 2008 on improving democracy, not only in Iceland, but a lot of other places in the world. Uh, I actually stepped down last January as CEO to pursue my new project, which is called Better News, but I'm still obviously active for the Citizens Foundation as well. Uh, we have been developing software and processes to try to get people to participate in uh, electronic democracy and new methods of democracy. And we have been quite successful. We've had over a million people uh, participating in the project that we are directly involved in. And the thing is that, yes, it's, uh, it's a more complicated issue than just technology. And that's what I have become mostly interested in, is how can we get people to participate because they want to. Tiago? Hi, uh, I'm Thiago from the World Bank. Um, I'm from the governance unit, governance practice, which we call, which we have the function to promote good governance. In my unit specifically, uh, what we do is to promote the use of technology to promote citizen engagement. So this can vary a lot. It can be from policy crowdsourcing to mobile participatory budgeting in Congo to uh, using cryptocurrency to provide grants to, and access to, uh, to poor farmers. Uh, this is one part, so it is supporting 
to put in place these systems. And the other one that we do is essentially evaluating and trying to understand what works and what doesn't work, because most of the times it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Ed? Hi, uh, I'm Ed McClough. I have uh, a social impact startup making technology, especially uh, called GABA, especially focused on consensus and consensus making. But currently I'm researching and writing a book about the origins and evolution of collective decision making. And the combination of these two things um, uh, is my current project, which is, I'm a bit out of place here, nothing to do with cities, the opposite. I'm working with small indigenous tribes, uh, trying to uh, bring them some technological capabilities for engaging with a very advanced uh, central technologies to uh, try and use democracy technologies in the interests of small, very remote communities and tribes. Well, uh, Ed, this is just a panel in which it's not about cities, because we have local, we have hyper-local, we have state, national, and we have supranational, which is something we, we want to assess. Like, how does it work? Because sometimes we can feel that civic technology is only for local communities and cities, like, okay, you can make a decision about what's the color of the bench in your park, but then you cannot act when you, you want to in, intervene in some bigger decisions like the health, education, the labor regulations. So this is something we, we will go into. Before starting the panel, I'm sorry, I forgot. This little number, if you want to go into the website to put some question is 5038. This is the, the number of the events, if you want to get there. So first of all, I would like to ask you how much, how much there is a reality and how much there is a mirage in civic technology transformation. Are we really empowering people and transforming democracy? Amelie? Um, civic, civic technology is technology. It's a tool, and uh, a tool is just a, a media to transform something. So it's, a, it's a necessary, it's a start, it's a push, because giving the tools to transform things, so that we have the means to do it, means that it's already the start of for changing things, it's the first step, but it is not enough. And if the administration um, is not responsive to this tool, if the administration is, uh, closes the tool and, uh, and, and uh, do not accept these changes, it will not work or it will take more time because I think it's a, the, it's, um, this is how the world, the world is going, so it will work, but it, it will just take more time and it will be more complicated. So civic technology is, uh, is necessary, but I would say not enough today. The real changes have to be also cultural changes within the administration, within uh, the relation between uh, the state and the citizens, uh, within the way that we work in the administration, on different way, on a legal way, but also on a technical way, on a structural way, on infrastructure way. Even if we're, uh, there's a lot of very, people very motivated within the state to change, there's so many barriers, security barriers, legal barriers, uh, administrative barriers, uh, that's, I mean, it will take time and all these levels need to change before the tools have a real impact, the civic technology have a real impact. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, I have to say I agree with everything that Emily said, actually. Uh, also, this really important thing of realizing that a tool is just a tool. It does not do anything on its own. Uh, the thing is that I think, no, we're not doing enough, and what we're doing is not working well enough for various reasons. Uh, I'll give you a bit because, yeah, I'll give you a bit of uh, background. I've, I've done quite a lot of work in Poland in different projects. And in the, uh, in the Soviet time, when Poland was a Soviet colony, so to speak, they had really strong democratic institutions in the cities and in the towns. They had autonomy over lots of things, but they were living under a totalitarian regime. 
So what we are doing with all our wonderful PB projects and e democracy projects is in a bit similar to this because we are not being allowed to make decisions or even have opinions on the bigger things, on the things that matter the most. And I don't know exactly why that is, but one thing I know is that once someone has power, he doesn't let go of it easily. And it's really, really, really hard to get governments, to get the bureaucratic system and the politicians to renounce any of the power they have. It is happening slowly here and there, but we're definitely not doing enough. Yeah, I mean, I agree, but just to disagree a bit. Uh, sure. So uh, recently, uh, we did a study looking at civic technology in developing countries. Uh, and we're trying to, to measure what impact they have. Do they document impact? And what is impact? You know, impact is not like how many people assessed your, your platform or anything like that or at least that would be an intermediate impact. What we saw is that the overwhelming majority of them were a failure. But these were looking at developing countries' initiatives. But you don't need to go very far. What is called civic tech now? 10 years ago in France, we called e-participation, or si. démocratie électronique. E and it he received huge amounts of funding all over Europe. Um, now you can go and consult and see how many of these platforms are online. I'll, I'll let you do the, the test. Now, there are some cases where they seem to be working. You know? uh, participatory budgeting in Paris. It's quite empowering. Uh, the city of Paris uh, was very nice in giving us some of their data, and we've been looking at it and how the choices. And you see that the citizens are spending the money in a way that is different from the government. So there's a difference. The thing is how we bring that to scale, but I think we're going to get to that later. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I agree with, uh, I mean, there's some aspects of that I disagree with a bit. Huge amounts of money dedicated to these projects. I don't see massive signs of dedication as a society to what could be done with technology to reanimate, reinvent the process. Uh, how much does a bridge across this canal cost? A couple of million. Uh, in order to, for example, completely surveil government to try and eradicate corruption, would not be a massive price ticket. So I don't see a lot of, I see amazing things going on, but in terms of whole countries dedicating big resources to uh, considering e-democracy as infrastructure, if you compare that to other infrastructure projects, it's nothing. And this is supposedly a very important one. On the other hand, I do think there's uh, yeah, more work to be done because we, if you look around the world in the developing world, uh, the, the truth is that without being really clear about what the enterprise is and what's the idea, is it just this nebulous idea of more participation, uh, more people deciding means better, you can get oneself into trouble and there's plenty of places which it's not working very well, yeah. even with the participation. I would like to point out in terms of measurement of success, what defines the success of a civic tech initiative because we have come a long way since the first participatory budget in Porto Alegre back in 1989, like, like 20 years. So people in this room were not born yet. And uh, we can see like this growing gap between people's expectation and the reality and the efficiency of civic technology initiatives. How shall we deal with this? How do we measure success and how do we work with this gap between expect people's expectations and real results that we can measure. And I'm talking about real impact, not outputs, because we, are, we have many studies and reports talking about outputs and number of citizens that went into the platform and vote for this and that. But do we really have some science behind this to measure the transformation that we are doing through civic technology? Tiago, I think you're the expert here. <laughs> Do we have some science that can support so, uh, the <laughs> changes? No, there, and there is, but it's always like case by case. Already civic tech is such an underdefined term, right? Yeah. Um, so, but uh, when we're looking at the things, the way we assess things that we look in terms of citizen engagement, we see three things. One, does it have effect 
on the citizen or on the participant. So as a citizen, do I feel more empowered? Do I feel more competent? Or do I start to create networks that I didn't have before? Now, does it change what, I call, what we call political efficacy? or a sense of political efficacy. So it's one, number one. Number two, that I look, does it promote a change in government? If citizens express a voice, does the government respond? And it's not just like a selective listening, no? It is really, do governments respond to them? Do they take actions that otherwise they would have not? And the third one is what we've been looking at. It's a developmental outcomes. So in participatory budgeting in Brazil now, for example, we see that cities that implemented versus cities that did not implement it, uh, it you had a reduction of infant mortality. That's a huge impact. That's, that's, a, that, that's an impact. So yes, you can measure. I think these three things, and I think they're all part of a chain somehow and mutually reinforcing. But again, there are lots of other things that are difficult to measure. Do you have experience in measuring results in France? Um, so th there are some in, in France, uh, not specifically, but some indicators on measuring, for example, uh, the trust the citizens have towards their government. Or, but I think civic tech, you said a lot of people want to participate. Now, we're in a culture, we're in a world where you, you, you ask Google a question and you get like, the answers and you, you know where to find the information. And so it's not understandable anymore for the people that they cannot find easy, easy information like the budget uh, that is spent from their state on Google or on, on, on a platform, on a state platform or, or quickly in a search engine. It's not understandable that they cannot dialogue really easily, that you still have to wait hours on the phone before you can actually have a question, you know, ask your question on a public service. This is not possible anymore. So these are the changes. Is civic tech the answer? It's probably really part of the answer. It could be high technology, it could be low technology. But I think the, the impact, measuring the impact, is seeing more how much people trust their government, how much people are happy within their, of, uh, for their public services, how much uh, uh, people believe that their state, I'm, I'm talking from a point of view of the administration, but the state is actually here to help them and to find solutions to their daily life and not just as a constraint and as a rigidity, which is today the feeling that most people, I mean, a lot of people have, is that, I mean, according, we have some measuring, um, Ipsos has done some, some uh, polls that shows that 70% of the French people believe that their, uh, their representative, political representative are corrupted or 80% of the French people believe that their administration does not have the answer they're uh, asking. These are the type of indicators that are really important and civic tech can help us to regain the trust of the citizen, m have better public services, more adapted to citizen, build the public services with them and it's part of the answer. I think it's not the only answer because civic tech is also a model of a certain society and we need to think first of the model of the society we want to have, uh, but it's definitely, it will help for sure. Uh, actually, the main criteria that we have used at the Citizen Foundation to measure uh, success is the only one that I know of that is uh, like a, uh, a concrete measurement, and that is by participation that obviously does not measure how good something came out or whatever, but those, those are all relative things. Uh, I agree with what they both said, there are ways to measure this, but it's also always the thing is, what does the measuring tool really tell you? Because this is really ambiguous. What is, is this a better project than this one? How is this different from the project that the city would have done? This is really, really hard to measure. Uh, but the main thing from my point of view, or from the Citizens Foundation point of view actually, is that participation is the cornerstone of democracy. If we don't have participation, we don't have democracy. If we have 10% participation in, uh, in participatory budgeting projects, then that's a lot on a world scale. But if you compare it to the 80% of whatever it is in your country of people that show up in election, 
then 10% is horrible. And also in connection with the uh, first question on Slido, uh, it is leaving behind a lot of people that we really need to get access to, we really need to get them active, because a lot of those people are the people that let themselves be feared into voting for Brexit and let themselves be feared into voting for Trump. We need to reach those people, but the right way to reach them is not saying, oh, we can't do e-democracy because never, not everybody can do it, because then we don't do anything. This, this goes directly to something that we spoke before, which is whether civic tech is something good by nature. Like, we, we like to think that anything related to giving people the opportunity to have a direct participation is good by the definition, but then there, in, there is this, there are all those questions about who's controlling this technology, what's happening with our data, who's controlling the data, and who is influencing people making those decisions. So who's to rule civic text and who's to monitor globally the technology that we are using to reinvent democracy? Are we safe in the hands of civic tech? No. <laughs> okay. No. I mean, a lot of, it's a good question. A lot of the civic tech uh, innovation is organized along commercial lines, and it's a, it's a kind of competitive space and an idea space, and so it has all the same dangers as any human enterprise where there's status and winners and losers and power and money. But coming back to the, the participation thing, I think you have to ask what's the purpose of the participation, even though it's hard to say. So what is the purpose of participation? And you begin to divide things up in this big scope of what all these different technologies are applied to. Are you talking about the ability to dismiss a leader? Are you talking about some kind of wisdom of crowds idea where it's good to have participation because then we get the best answer? But we all know there's many domains in which we don't want that. It, does your hospital work by this method? Does your football team work by this method? No. You're out there supporting and participating in its success, but you don't get everyone to help decide who's going to be on the team. And those are just two small areas where it's perfectly obvious we're very comfortable with that, with that difference. So what I'm driving at is a little more clarity in what participation, sure, you can say it's always good, but there, there are two or three different areas um, which public participation can be applied to. One is making sure that government and policy are not corrupt. And this has been at the heart of the development of democracy uh, since its inception. It's a set of procedures to avoid us getting screwed over, not to get what we want. And talking about attitude, lowering the bar to recognize that, that a more negative conception of the whole idea, which is that these type of democratic processes, their ultimate goal is to accept things that we don't want rather than achieve things that we do want. Because if all we're doing is trying to achieve optimum things that we do want, I can tell you the answer ahead of time, which is there's going to be a conflict. Um, everyone's not going to be completely happy with any solution. So it seems obvious to me that uh, a lot of the necessity of participation, and this is what we see in the tribes, is partly a ritual of agreement, like smoking a peace pipe, going through a process which enables one to literally make peace with a result which isn't exactly what one demands or what the politicians have told you to expect, but um, is some kind of a societal process that enables us to harmonize conflicting objectives, conflicting resources. And maybe that's the type of thing that should be the aim, the design aim of some of these new civic tech processes. You have experiences in many different areas and on the levels of administration. How can we deal with the uneven level of access of people to technology and civil, civic tech and making decisions at the hyper-local at the small communities, at the local, national, and supranational level. It's really so difficult to 
to make e-democracy or direct democracy something that's workable in the different levels of the administration? Why is that? Why should it be so difficult? Uh, maybe uh, I can take this, but I can first in response to what Ed says. The reason for the participation, that we need participation, is one is legitimacy. Because if we don't have enough people participating, then who is making the decisions and who is being left out? But I agree we should be striving towards getting better results for sure. But the basic reason that I see for what is not happening is what I said in my introduction is that it's very, very hard to wrestle the power of the important things away from those who have that power today. And even when those people want to let go of the power, the system itself has become locked in and it's very hard to make changes in that area. And if I can jump in there, I don't resist. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think one of the things that it's the epistemic value of democracy. I mean, if, if it is the capacity to aggregate and to leverage dispersed knowledge uh, and, and to come to, to better decisions. Now, there are some cases, of course, uh, well, let's see, there's last year's where you did that and it was a total failure. But then it is because of poor institutional design. It is poor institutional design. 99% of the times when participation fails in terms of they chose the wrong thing is because you put a pretty bad process in place. So they chose the wrong thing. So what was the point of the whole theater then? We so, know what the right thing is. So, no, it is not that. And maybe you, what I'm saying is that you're creating, you're asking extremely complicated because you want to legitimate as well. And you want to get also some level of consensus and so on. But then there are other things. So to give an example nowadays, in Oregon for citizen initiatives, now what they do, they have a deliberative process before where citizens are informed and everything and they make recommendations to the voters, and that significantly improves the process. So there are many processes recently that we saw that they could have been improved by institutional design. Is this bad design on purpose? Hmm? Is this bad design on purpose most of the time? Uh, well, when you start to, to put forward decisions, in, uh, put forward democratic decisions in an opportunistic way, I would say that is... <laughs> That is not a very good choice, yeah, and sometimes on purpose. It depends what, also what, what metaphor you're using. Okay, if you're designing systems, um, most probably it's legacy. So yeah. you're designing into the London metro system. You can have a lot of great ideas, but the tunnels are where they are. It's 100 years old. What are you going to do? In fact, it's amazing what's been done, mm. given that this is a, an old system. So... There's the initial starting conditions, there's what the enterprise itself is, mm -hmm. which is the part that I think is least clear um, yeah, in, what, when what listening to these things. I mean, what's the whole enterprise uh, goal of, of uh, these types of technologies? Because as long as, they're, as long as it's so confused, the answer to that question, then it, the power is going to stay more or less where it is. Mm -hmm because we'll have a lot of confused solutions to, to, to things which aren't really, really clear problems. I see. How you design the process is essential to address one of the questions that someone put on Slido, which is, will civil tech let down the most vulnerable citizen? What happens with people who don't have the skills, who don't have the access? Are people who are not in Facebook left aside in the civic tech movements? How, how do different administrations work with this? I, I think um, it's a question, I mean, civic tech and technology is a problem because in fact there are a lot of people that do not have access, that do not know how to use it. In France we say there's 10% of, uh, of uh, people that are outside of, of, of the, all the civic movement and digital movement uh, Digital illiterate problem. Um, but there again, um, uh, civic tech is, is just, I mean, it's, uh, it could be, it's just a part of it, of changing the whole system. So today, I mean, we have a system. You're talking about direct democracy. I'm, I'm just, what you said a while ago now, one of your questions. I'm just thinking, is that what we want? Is that what we want? Is it direct democracy? Do we want every single people to be yeah, able to say something on everything, on health policy? 
on school, on, on, on the national, uh, national level, the local level. Is that really the system that we want? I don't know. Me, we are supposed to no, live in, no, the, in my opinion. In but I don't think that any advocate of direct democracy yeah, yeah. advocates okay. for that. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. Well, that's uh, yeah, a bit of a straw man argument, or some, some fanatics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so today, our best, you were talking about civic tech being able to aggregate uh, the, the strongest opinion and the majority. I mean, today... No, the dispersed knowledge. It's very different. Knowledge. That's true. But today we have, I mean, we have, we have, our, we, we vote for people, we vote for deputies that are supposed to do this, that are supposed to, you know, represent uh, the general interest, the common good. The problem is we don't believe they do anymore. I mean, most of the people don't believe they do anymore. And this is how we say, well, maybe a robot, maybe a machine will do it better. At least it will have a neutral opinion and it won't have, you know, a political opinion behind. And... But actually, this machine is also designed by people behind. So it also has a base and also have a certain point of view. And so, but the machine, at least, could be transparent the way it's designed and couldn't be uh, uh, constant, like the same, you know, once it's designed, it remains, it doesn't change according to its mood or according to the context. Or the so that's one thing that the machine can bring. But still, I mean, so coming back to your question, will it forget the most vulnerable people. The way it's designed, it could be designed to include uh, the, the, the general interest and the common good, actually. It's just really about the model that we want to push and the way we will design it. This is what it's all about. It's all about this political decision because it will remain political decision and ideological vision behind this is what's important. And then the tool, it will be designed the way that we decide that it will be designed. Just to agree on that question, um, on gender. There are differences on gender. We looked at Fix My Street. You, everybody knows Fix My Street. It's kind of like, oh, there's a pothole. Sure. Uh, and we saw when you sign as a man, government is more likely to respond to your problem than if you're a woman. On the other hand, there's change.org that follows a very different design and even though most men create petitions, women's petitions tend to be the ones that win the most. So you have matters of design, a black box of design and how it affects groups that we still need to open. As Amelie said before, uh, algorithm has our political decisions. The way you design the, the program and the project have political consequences always. Who has some ideas about how to... Yeah, I mean, this is uh, the behind. thing that most people don't realize, but which you put quite succinctly, is that uh, it is the design of the tool that has an enormous effect on the output. And what that means is that we have to experiment a lot and find out what works, but not only experiment, but also check what came out of the experiment instead of just jumping to the next one. And... A, this is not something that we are just going to like shake out of a bag and say, here, she already made e-democracy. We've been doing this kind of stuff for years, but we are not really close to finding anything that's like the thing. But we have to experiment, we have to try, because otherwise we don't get there. It well, I, I would like to go back to one question that Ed answered before with a rotund no. And the question was something like, are we safe in the hands of TV technology? Because when all this process began, which is difficult to say exactly when was it, uh, for example, when, when social networks explode, we had all this literature about how our politician and administrator, we have the opportunity to have a direct conversation with communities so they could ask them about their needs and their aims and their aspirations. So they could be like, like a town hall in a global network through internet. But then when, what we saw was those politicians and those political parties hiding those very fancy communication uh, consultants. So they will send uh, social network campaigns to promote their agenda. And 
Is there a really big change in terms of money in politics and merchandising and campaigning, no matter how you do it? It's just that we move from the television to the social networks, but the way we interact with our political representatives and they interact with citizens is pretty much the same. We just change the custom. I mean, I can say the problem is uh, corruption and uh, you're talking about corruption money and money yeah, through yeah, the system. Yeah. I mean, where, where I'm working to, to help with democracy in, you know, little Indian, uh, indigenous tribe in the mountains, then you have that capability of everyone, of real face-to-face -face lines of communication between people, la, la, la. And you also have the interesting setup where precisely what you need to help with is ability to interface with the highly technologized and big number politics um, that comes from the center. And so you see those two things side by side. And I, I've been looking at a case where a name of a town is changed by referendum. So supposedly the most democratic means of everything. And it magically loses its indigenous name and becomes called Puerto Bello or something. And this is just a really good example of um, the, yes, it's corrupt practices, but it's also it's also just not being able to interface with the new designs and news realities that all these smart people are coming up with. Um, the speed of innovation going faster than a capability to, to interact with it or build up the kind of traditions or methods that make those kind of new practices stick and really work for, for all people in a society. So it's a really difficult problem. The only thing I always comment on with these questions about security and corruption is going back to what I mentioned before. At its very inception, democracy is just a set of techniques to avoid corruption. The existing system is corrupt. In this conference, you hear a lot about go getting back our democracy and going back and getting it back. I don't know when we're referring to precisely. Is this, was this the 80s? Was this the 70s? <laughs> when, when, was, when are we getting it back from? And I never heard my parents be like, oh, in my day. Everybody listened to me. And, uh, yeah, was, we had it perfect. <laughs> but that, that's the, the kind of story that goes around. Gunnar, how do you see the security issue? Who's controlling what happened? Who's controlling technology? And who's controlling the data? Who's con influencing elections? Uh, well, the thing is that I don't think the world has changed in the big picture in that the people that have the money, they can do the stuff the way that they like. That's our big problem is because if we want to do something new and something uh, interesting and get people to participate, then we need money to do that. And we can so also at the end of the day, you keep asking for money and sponsorship no, I mean, and grants to the same power. Yeah, but that, that's the thing also is that, uh, I mean, it's not necessarily the same person that's really good at getting good ideas about improving society and creating projects and creating software as the person who's good at getting funding. But you need to work together. I exactly. Mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. It, it, it has to be a combination of those talents, as in so many cases. I'm not, mm. I'm not like out in the corner crying or anything. But, but no, but seriously, it is a... Uh, uh, I'm not worried about the security aspect, actually, at the moment. I'm worried about that the world seems to be going more or less towards a totalitarian, not going there immediately, but it's getting worse in so many countries. We have democracies that are not really democracies anymore. And I totally agree with Ed. When, whenever did we have a democracy? I don't, I don't know when that was. But the thing is still is that the democracy that we have today is quite a lot better than the totalitarian regimes that we have had and quite a lot better than having a king who's a god, so it has improved. Uh, but again, the, the security aspect is so minor concerned with getting the influence in the things that really matter. 
because the thing is that when you're doing PBs and when you're doing like small electronic democracies, they're actually not interesting enough for the people that want to hack into your stuff and damage it. If you see what I mean, you don't. There's not enough incentive for the uh, for the crooks to go in and steal it. But once we start getting access to the big questions, then we need to worry about security. Right now, we need to worry about participation. We need to worry about legitimacy. We need to worry about uh, are the people's voices really being listened to? And for me, that's the really most important issue at this point. But then again, I've never been security obsessed. I'm more into doing things than worrying about what can go wrong. But I'm very happy that there are people in the world <laughs> that are on the other scale. I, mean, um, I, I, would, I would say that uh, there are ways of uh, being safe with civic tech. For example, I would take an example of a project. There again, experimentation that we're doing within the French state is that we're developing a platform. Uh, where we're working with some civic, the civic tech community, some some are, uh, some um, civil society organizations, some, and some are, are, are private uh, sector organizations to give the state uh, participatory tools. So this this is a platform where today we it's a pilot project. We have four tools. Um, and we want to say the tell the administration, look, we, we want you to, be, to consult a lot more the citizens, so we give you the tools that in, you know, in, in, in five clicks, in a really easy and simple way, you can consult the citizens on a text, on a question, on an open forum, on different format. And, but the thing is, this is the, we want to make sure that the opinion of the citizens are not manipulated. We want to make sure. So you have basic criteria, and here again, it can always be improved. This is very the, really the beginning. But we we say okay, we we only take uh, uh, participation tools that uh, have a open source code algorithm behind, so that we make sure that you know you have uh, usually people can vote on the on the on the what is said on the platform, and and then the vote, the one that have the most votes goes up. So that we make sure that we, this is transparent and anybody can consult who voted, if it's really the one that got the most vote that is up, etc. So this has to be transparent. We say, for example, that um, the data has to be, uh, th there needs to be a declaration to the CNIL, which is the, the French institution that, that makes sure that the personal data are protected. And that it has to be in Europe, uh, um, uh, stocked in Europe. Uh, we, we have, uh, you can put kind of all these criteria of, but I think transparency is one of the best um, obstacle to manipulation. And of course, awareness uh, that when people uh, use a tool, they know what's behind. Um, when people do, do people know when they use Facebook, what is done with their data? And this is something where you, I mean, the state has a real role of regulation European Union, the state, where, which level it has to be, um, has a real role of informing, regulating, putting some rules. I'm curious about your opinion about the media in terms of people's awareness. What's the role played by mainstream media in terms of giving the information about the opportunities that people have to, to access civic text? You have an opinion on this, I know that, yeah. Uh, from our experience in Iceland, the media is not at all interested in any kind of improvement to society. Well, that's a tough yeah, one. <laughs> no, but seriously, <laughs> seriously, just getting like a really successful PB into the news is a lot of work. And the thing is that media, like classical media today, it works not in the way that we think that it works. It works in the way that those who are most pushy at getting to the people of the media to get them to cover this stuff, they get covered. That's like, an, like a generalization and all that, and it's not the same everywhere. But the thing is that this is so really, really important. And this is actually one of the reasons why I quit as a CEO of Citizens Foundation and started on my Better News project, because we can have all the PBs in the world and e-democracies, but if we don't give the people or if the people don't have the data that they need in order to make an informed decision, then we're not going to get good results. 
So the project I'm working on now is based on the assumption that media, classical media is not going to be that thing. And the only way to do this is that we ourselves start writing the news. So I'm proposing that to create a crowdsourced media outlet that would not only be for the people and by the people, but actually the people that would be doing the good stuff will be getting paid for it from the people that are using it. I would say that the media should be a natural partner of those initiatives. A natural? Partner. Uh, I have, after worked with the classical institutions on many levels and many things for many years, I have come to the conclusion that it's not worth my time to spend time trying to change dinosaurs. So I'm just going to leave the dinosaurs to evolve on their own, but I think that we need to go at this from outside the system because the system cannot be changed from within. It needs, a, sorry, I really appreciate the work that everybody who's doing, trying to change it from within is doing, to be clear on that. I really appreciate that's just not my cup of tea anymore after so many frustrating meetings, moments, and things where you can see this is not happening, nothing is going to change here unless we come at it from the outside with enough people to have the, the, uh, the power to change, really, really change things. Well, the media ecosystem is very diverse. It's uh, not just yes. dinosaurs. On the, on the, on the, fringe, yeah. on the fringes, yeah. yes. On the yeah. fringes, but not the media. Uh, I mean, the media that I look at yeah. is what you're talking about. I agree on that. But the media that 80, yeah. 90% of the population of the world is looking yeah. at is not doing that kind of thing. It's the same news recurgated again and again. And most of it is it's so biased that it, uh, you have to watch, I don't know how many news outlets to try to get some sort of neutral aspect coming yeah. out of it. Your experience is different, Ed? Oh, oh yes, we need to go to the Slido. I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to the Slido to have questions from the people, but if you want to just raise your hand because you didn't have time or didn't feel like going into the website, you just do it and we will bring you the microphone. Uh, well, we have a question which we address already, which is, which will civil tech let down the most vulnerable citizen? And then we have this at war. What's the role of private corporation in the civic tech? Do they have some civic, civic duty in this? Are big tech companies participating? Uh, are business angel? We were talking about finance in the projects and the initiatives. Do you see uh, the private sector being active in civic tech, like promoting the innovation in civic technology or participating directly? Do they have to? Do they have a duty to do so? Tiago? I mean, you have the, the funders, big funders, OMIGR Foundation, Hewlett Foundation, are some of yeah. the biggest funders on civic tech, right? But then you have the other side, which is big companies, social networks and so on that I won't say names, but that they could be doing a better job in using their tools to, to better promote. But again, uh, social networks, it, well, I'm gonna give an example, Facebook, everybody thinks of it as a public sphere, but it's not. It's more like the plaza, the food plaza of a small mall where you can interact, but I mean, it's still a private space where you're interacting. So if we really think that it's important for democracy and so on, then it's government that has to regulate. But if not, we can't be, let's say, whining and hoping that they'll do something on their own because they're there for, for private enterprise and, and that's the way it works. I know it's, it doesn't go totally with the consensus, but um, if we think something's extremely, it's a public good, and it has good or bad consequences in societal effects, regulate it. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with that. Those, uh, those large entities, this, the stuff that they're working on out there can be of tremendous value and, uh, and use in the civic tech domain. Um, scarily so, precisely because they, while we in the civic tech world are not clear on what the enterprise is, they are clear. And, and it will tend to go in that direction. 
um, and be used for their own uh, benefit one way or the other. There do seem to be uh, examples of these big uh, corporations taking on board, whether for optics or to try and appear more uh, largesse, uh, taking on some kind of uh, civic duty kind of uh, narrative into their yeah. whole existence. We'll have to wait and see what that uh, What are the main sources of funding for independent initiatives, in your case, and Gunnar in the foundation? The main sources of financing are... Yeah. Uh, it's a struggle. It's, uh, we have a regular project going on with the city of Reykjavik, and there is some money coming in there but uh, that's so little that actually we have a deal, if you could call it that, is that we do 50% of the work for free. And uh, then we have like projects which are grant-based and projects that which uh, are by a government. But, I mean, this is something I've been talking about for years. It's that it's one of the biggest problems in, in our sector is that there is a huge divide between the money and the people doing the work. And it's, uh, the thing is that when you have then coming in uh, private corporations, then the problem becomes what is their agenda? What is their reason for wanting to do this? And I'm fine with it as long as there are rules going down and they're saying, well, you have to do it like this and like that and like this. And actually coming back to the security question, one, in one part that should be a requisite for every e-democracy project is that the software is open source. Because if it's not, then there's no way of knowing what is happening inside the, the, okay. the software. So it, it's, it, it's not because I'm an open source affinity, it, it's just, it's so obvious. We cannot do it in any other way if we want to trust the results. And we go back to transparency. It doesn't matter whether it's a small exactly. civic initiative, a private, a small foundation, or a national government. That's the only, the only rule. So, the purpose of civic technology is inclusive governance, Amelie? You went from open data to open gov. Is inclusive governance the purpose of civic technology? I'm going to repeat. So the purpose of civic technology is, uh, is uh, what the people want to make out of it. No, it's, uh, it's, um, I mean, it's, uh, yes, the, I think the majority of the people we work with, at least, or I know in civic technology, their purpose is inclusive governance, more fair governance, dividing the power, that the power is not only in the hand of, the few, of a few people, um, is, is uh, giving back the power to all the people and not to only a small group of people. Um, the, the, I, the purpose of civic technology is, uh, is helping us to build a better democracy where the people will trust their government, trust their society, and feel that they're being heard. Can I say, I think sure. that's, that's really nice. And the, but I think there's two purposes, if, if I understand the question correctly. One is to improve something like what we have. This, uh, this, you know, we've got these processes, these things that it's supposed to do on the tin, and we can make them better and do more stuff like that. But the other idea, and I think something that inspires a lot more people here, is, is the purpose of civic technology is to explore and potentially exploit an idea space of different configurations uh, what can be created with, with applying these new technologies in new ways and uh, really we just need a bit of space within which to do that. Um, we may find it in different areas. I find it in the, you know, little villages in the mountains. Yeah. Um, the other speakers today have been talking about the need for sandboxes, um, things so we can answer that question with, with more acuity. Um, the purpose of it is to find out what it can do or if it's a total disaster. Um, and uh, so improving what we have now, sure, like the post office or whatever, but, but that's only really half the story. And it's a working in process always. We need to finish. If, if there is any question in the room, I have one petition before we leave. I would like to ask you to mention three, three, three things that 
people attending the WeShare Festival can do starting right now with or without technology to improve our democracy? Please. With or without algorithm, what shall we do starting now? Go and read uh, something. One thing I would strongly advise you, especially during this festival, but in general, when someone starts talking about technology, you should have a huge warning sign above your head and think, what is it for? What are we going to use it for? Why are we doing this? And not like, oh, that's nice software. So good advice. Emily? One? Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking for, from my point of view, so the French administration. Concrete things, please be optimistic. You know, be, yeah. be critical, but be optimistic. We are trying to make things better. Uh, and the second thing is, well, we're trying all types of different experimentation through hackathon, open ministry, uh, what we're doing at least on the French national state. So you're more than welcome. Please come and help us <laughs> when we're doing these events. Unfortunately, mostly in Paris, which is already a mistake, but in France. And the third thing I would say, um, you, I don't know if you heard about the Open Government Partnership. The Open Government Partnership is an international organization. I mean, it's, a, it's, a civil, it's an association by its legal status, but it's 75 countries and thousands of civil society organizations discussing together and exchanging on the best practices and what could be better. France is represented. Uh, Etalab is representing France in, in this partnership. And uh, we, need, we need civil society to, to, to push us. We need... So please join this initiative if you have an organization and come and, and, and tickle us and, and push us to be more, you know, exemplary, more um, uh, to, to, to try to push things further on. Ed. I would say, because I don't really know the answer, do stuff for the environment. Uh, I'm not quite sure how, but I think that this is the... Uh, it's the reason for, it's nice all this stuff about everyone's voices getting heard and everything else, and I think it's great, but the environment, <laughs> you can't lose if you try and help the environment. If you can, man. And it's, it's a kind of uniting uh, practice, which to me can, it, one of the few areas that has a potential to lay the groundwork for some kind of collaborative platform or anything else is keeping the animals and the, and the trees going. Uh, so that's what I would say, and talk to people. Uh, Listen. Yeah. And, yeah, it's a big question. <laughs> so, uh, no, I think if you're doing something, always ask yourself, is it really making a difference? And try to doubt yourself, because many times we like to think that we're making more difference than we actually are. And if after assessing you realize that it's not making a lot of difference, try to do it differently until you start to get it right. Thank you so much. If I may say just one thing from my part, please keep in mind that you are now in one place which is full of very innovative and inspiring people doing great things in all type of places around the world. So take the opportunity to talk to them, talk to everybody sitting next to you, actively listen, connect and learn because we have a great opportunity sharing here. Thank you so much to all of you.